Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, please stay with us for a little while longer and welcome with me together Mr. Divaka Gupta. It's only a week ago that the Asian Development Bank held its annual meeting in Frankfurt, a very successful, if I might congratulate you on that one. Mr. Gupta is a vice president for private sector and co-financing operations since August 2015. He oversees CADB's assistance to private sector projects with development impact, but limited access to capital. He is also responsible for building and maintaining co-financing partnerships, so it's the right place to be here. Under ADB's long-term strategy 2020 framework, ADB is calling for its support in these two areas of activities. He will be discussing on financial inclusion with Professor Pfingsten. Professor Pfingsten is a professor for business studies at the Westfalische Wilhelms Universität Münster. Since 1999, a member of the North Rhine-Westphalia Ac Academy of Sciences, and his main research is on risk management and bank regulation. A warm welcome. The floor is yours. Let me remind those of you who are disappointed that we are not talking about the Brexit, that the Brexit hopefully is only a short-term issue and therefore doesn't qualify for the tectonic or the teutonic shift uh, anyway. So um, did you know that 2 billion people, that is 38% of all adults, according to World Bank research, do not use formal financial services? You may believe that uh, less income goes along with a higher probability of being unbanked. But did you know that 73% of poor people are unbanked indeed? Um, technology has improved this situation and will probably continue to improve this situation. Um, and we'll um, turn to that later on. And in that sense, we're also continuing the previous panel on digitalization. And it's my pleasure and honor to have you, Mr. Gupta, here um, to discuss these issues. Um, I already mentioned the large number of uh, people being unbanked. Does that, uh, does, do these numbers match your own experience from different countries you're visiting and you're responsible for? Right, so uh, I've been with the ADB for the last year or so, but I was a career banker in India before that. I was with State Bank of India, and I have seen financial exclusion and financial inclusion efforts very closely as they have rolled out in India. And of course, I've picked up on some of the uh, data and experiences while I was, after I came to ADB. Uh, the fact of the matter is that one third of the world's population is in poverty. And this population is largely excluded. Uh, the reasons are many, <laughs> but basically since this is a, a gathering of people who understand commerce so well. The fact is that at the bottom of the pyramid, you don't have huge pools of money. But in order to intermediate financially the way we have known the financial sector to be, you need critical mass. So if I were to draw upon India itself as an example, and I'll be doing that a lot because mm -hmm. that, uh, that is something I know better than the other places. India lives in about 600,000 agglomerations of population of which 500,000 are 2,000 or less. <coughs> Conventional mainstream banking can never reach these places because it is simply unviable. The brick and mortar, the security, the staff, and the cost of people, uh, it won't happen. And uh, that's the reason why for several decades in developing uh, uh, parts of the world, including emerging Asia, financial exclusion has been uh, very, very rampant. Uh, <coughs> Fortunately, technology has changed that a lot over the last 10 years. So if you look at different waves of financial inclusion, you found initially some efforts in the mid 90s and they usually failed because it was a push product. Mm -hmm. <coughs> banks, especially the public sector banks, were forced to open a lot of accounts. That was a cost they bore because it was policy. Those accounts would remain dormant. Eventually they would be closed. Then came technology and let's say around 2009, 2010, 
<coughs> we started uh, uh, getting two models. Uh, it was either a <coughs> smart card and pin, or it was a POS kind of a terminal with the biometric fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And that's when the next wave of financial inclusion came. Technology has, of course, moved very, very rapidly. Today, uh, technology is ubiquitous. There were startups who tried to make a model around proprietary technology. That's all gone. Today, it's very simple and easy to have a biometric system. In India, they are experimenting with something. <coughs> Already, there is a $100 phone which can be used for iris authentication. Mm -hmm. And a backbone has to be created. So, uh, inclusion will be greatly aided by technology. Fr from the outside, this um, sounds surprising, I think. Because first of all, you may not automatically believe that in a rural, maybe, society that's uh, to some extent relying on barter trade and so on, uh, financial services are so important in the first place, which may contribute to the non-viability of earlier approaches. Um, how can you say something about the impact uh, the exclu exclusion had on, on people before? Well, I mean, uh, there are live examples in the remote areas, people don't know where to keep money if they were to save. Okay. So literally, uh, in some of the tribal areas, women would buy coins of silver and wear them as beads around their neck because that's one way of carrying their physical savings with them. Okay. I remember when the Delhi airport was being renovated and I've uh, known the companies that financed it. I mean, there are cases where laborers would be paid and the person who was paying them would keep the money back at a 15% cut because that's the only way that money could be saved. Okay. They would remit it after six months when they went home. So, you know, uh, the extent of exclusion and the hardship and uh, exploitation uh, that it can bring is, is tremendous. Okay. Um, would you say that the, um, the in, in the private banking business, I mean, in the personal banking, uh, the uh, exclusion is more important or more severe than, for example, for potential founders of small businesses? So is this saving the major problem or the uh, access to, to loans there? No, I would think it's both, but it naturally has to first begin on the liability side. Mm -hmm. Most people have uh, not had an account. They don't know the benefits of it, so all utility payments are done in cash. It's a cash economy. At best, some of these emerging economies use 5% of the total transaction volume cashless. Mm -hmm. So at the individual level, apart from just the volume, the convenience of it, you have to stand in a queue, you have to pay a bill, you don't know how to you know, uh, do go about it in case there is a long queue, in case the bank is closed, in case you are not well. Uh, that's one portion of it. But yes, <coughs> as far as credit is concerned also, a very large part of the small and micro enterprises would benefit a lot from an analytics engine where behavior itself could uh, 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 determine uh, eligibility for credit. Because otherwise, uh, again, uh, the macro and the micro don't match. At the macro level, they must be intermediated. At the micro level, the manager who's taking a decision mm -hmm. has to be sure that he's picking up the right, right uh, candidate okay. to give credit. Um. When you're looking at obstacles for um, getting access to, to banking services, um, there are different um, candidates, I would say. Uh, let me mention three, and my question for you will be, what is the most important of those? Uh, first, uh, cost for the user. Second, travel distances to branches. Or third, legal requirements for banks. For example, know your customer rules and so on. What's the biggest obstacle? Well, that's a, very, that's a very hard question to answer, but I would say where it's a question of excluded people, just the access is the most important. So you can call it cost of travel, you can call it the cost of reaching a point that will give intermediation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the most important Okay. at the very bottom of the pyramid. Um, one uh, instrument that uh, relies on technology um, was mentioned by Gottfried Leibrandt um, earlier today, namely the M-Pesa system in, in Kenya. Um, you want to make some remarks on that? Sure. So I think there have been several such uh, initiatives around the world, and they are largely categorized into two buckets. It's either a telco-led model or a bank-led model. 
MPESA is a telco led model. And MPESA was successful because there was no alternative. And therefore, people, irrespective of the charges, and I'm told that the smaller ticket and the charges were not insignificant, the fact is that it was a choice against not having anything. And MPESA was hugely successful. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, for some of you who might not know this system, uh, they make payments via from mobile phone to mobile phone. You do not even need a smartphone, just a regular phone will do, because they're using the SMS system there. Uh, right. So, yeah. That's right. Uh, um, uh, it, it was a model where a person who did not have a bank account could actually remit. So it was through a network of agents, and it was using the mobile network. And uh, M-Pesa even today remains a success story in Kenya, mm -hmm. some of the other places. At the same time, and I was reading this report just a few days ago, M-Pesa has not been successful in South Africa. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, the reason for that is that South Africa otherwise is a very intermediated uh, market. Um, you, you mentioned the, the cost uh, for, for people here. Um, when you look at the literature, on, on reports on the cost of these payment systems. Um, the numbers are very, very different. For example, they say that for um, um, transferring small amounts of money the, or s withdrawing money from account, sometimes the fees go up to 60% or something like that. On the other hand, when you go to the websites, um, you have numbers like uh, withdrawing a thousand uh, Kenyan shillings, which is uh, something like 10 euro. The cost would be 33 Kenyans and shillings, so we're talking about um, 30 cents about. So this doesn't sound dramatic to me. Um, do you have an explanation, or are, is this, this market on the move in the sense that the rates for these kind of services come down dramatically, or is this just wrong reports in some of the media? If it's a technology model, then and that's where regulation, education, and uh, guidance to governments uh, is very important. If it's a technology-led model, uh, the cost of settling a transaction is, is literally a few cents. There is nothing more. But if you have a web of people who are giving those services, then those costs get added on. So uh, 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 I would, uh, again, give the most recent example of uh, Aadhaar-based, uh, it's called Aadhaar, it's an acronym. Uh, the government of India uh, started this latest drive in 2014, and they've opened a billion accounts. The backbone for it has been created by the government. So there is the National Payments Corporation of India that, that does settlement, and there is the unique identification authority which keeps the biometrics. So today, almost 90% uh, of the country's population is on the biometric model. And the uh, National Payments Corporation maintains a registry in which they map the account to the unique identification. So I can, for example, send money to you just sitting across here uh, at the press of a button on my mobile. This actually costs nothing. And the rates for that are one cent for a transaction. And that transaction, th that rate is a flat rate. So it's actually for free. And it doesn't, uh, you know, there is no intermediation. It can dr come down dramatically. That's the beauty of disruptive uh, technology. So with this success story in mind, would you say the main obstacle uh, for um, um, financial inclusion is unwillingness of government to support such activities? No, I wouldn't say that. I would only say that the government has a very major role as an enabler to promote it. Now, why did the earlier financial inclusion uh, uh, initiatives not be so successful? There's a combination of factors, and technology is a very, very central one. It's moved so much in the last five years that what was not viable in 2010 can be done for a fraction of, a, of the cost today. Uh, but more importantly, uh, people should find a use for it. And those who have never seen an account, they don't understand what it means to save. They don't understand what it means to thereafter be able to contribute to micro insurance, to a micro systematic investment plan, savings. That is something where a lot of education and a lot of sensitization of the population is uh, required. But one more thing uh, that happened in the latest uh, successful phase of inclusion in India is that now the government is using it. So all subsidies, uh, uh, 
government benefits and transfers are now flowing through the system. So there is a pull factor. Earlier, the banks were going after people because they had targets to show. Today, people are queuing up at banks to say, I need this account because the LPG subsidy will flow into it, the fertilizer subsidy will flow into it, the food subsidy will flow into it. So the fact that a usage for the account has been created is itself uh, a big enough hook for the activity to take off. What uh, role does trust play in this setting? Uh, trust plays a very big role, but I don't think that trust is the reason why people don't uh, okay. uh, use the facility. That's my assessment. Mm -hmm. It's just that they are neither aware nor uh, in a position to access. You know, in the normal course, if a person were to, if a, if a laborer were to walk into a bank branch, he may not even be entertained. There is an aura of impregnability around uh, white collar offices. And uh, he is not likely to even approach. If he does approach, he may be given some story to say, come back after a week. Uh, we are being, we've got too many people today, etc., etc. So I think it's really uh, the accessibility which prevents him mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. Um, turning our view from the customers to the providers, um, are these mobile payment services that uh, enhance um, financial inclusion, are they a profitable business? I think it's, it's, it's a question of volume, and therefore geographies which have a huge amount of critical mass there are at an advantage. Mm -hmm. They benefit from the law of large numbers. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if uh, let us say, you were to take a billion transactions a day, and you were to charge a cent for a transaction. It is $10 million of revenue a day. I think th that's the kind of revenue opportunity that exists. Now, obviously, uh, you will have different uh, rules of the marketplace playing when there are a lot of operators. So maybe you'll start with 20, they'll get reduced to seven or eight. Mm. And if you have, uh, uh, you know, a billion dollars of revenue, or uh, yeah, uh, maybe yeah, about a billion dollars of revenue across seven or eight players, it's viable. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so you do not see any market failure there. As, an, as economists, we would uh, ask, for example, is there a market failure that um, um, for kind of forces us to um, put state banks in there to, to support this business or? No, I, d I don't think we risk a market failure, but we do need a guiding hand from the policy makers and from the regulators to see that A, there is no arbitrage, and B, uh, this integrity of the system is not violated. Mm -hmm. Now, one way of doing it is, is to ensure that the backbone providers and the banks are in partnership rather than one or the other. Mainstream banks will never be able to have the distribution network, which let us say a telco has. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or even a direct marketing company or an internet Amazon kind of a company has. Whereas these companies need to, we need to be sure that the cash that flows through these transactions is ring fenced from these providers while they are intermediating. Mm -hmm. There are ways of doing it. And uh, obviously as experience is gained, uh, this will evolve further, but that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, this solution from India, um, in what sense could that be exported? I mean, you, you mentioned the law of large numbers there in a sense, so um, there is uh, not very many uh, countries with the number of inhabitants as in India. Um, so uh, how's your view on the possibility to scale this model and then um, yeah. improve in financial inclusion in other countries? Right, I think uh, mm, once a backbone has been created, Today, technology allows that backbone to be used in any geography, anywhere. I mean, it's the death of time and distance. You could be hosting something in Australia or in Germany or in Singapore, and you could be intermediating in Africa, anywhere. So I think once the backbone is created, uh, even for the smaller economies, they could well leverage the same backbone with the adequate checks uh, and you know, firewalls around it. Mm -hmm. The question then is, how do you educate people and how do you reach them for the first time? I think that's where um, a government initiative and some amount of one-time subsidization will be necessary. Okay. Um, 
I think we better come to an end to make up for uh, the overtime we uh, sacrificed for um, Minister Schäuble. Um, sustainability requires that the finance on the move, as is written down there, does not leave millions or even billions of people behind. Therefore, financial inclusion, I think we agree, is crucial. Um, and to wind up our conversation, I'd like to ask you to complete the following sentence. The biggest challenge for financial inclusion is getting the people to use it for the first time. Thank you. On this note, thanks, Mr. Gupta, Thank and thanks for having Thank us you here. Very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gupta. Thank you very much, Professor Pinkson.